thanks very much for inviting me here, and thanks all to you to get up early for this uh, last day of the conference. So, yeah, what I'm talking about uh, today is the first results we've obtained with the very recently installed beryllium anodes, uh, electrodes, which I we're pretty sure is the first time beryllium has been used with the plasma focused device. Um, and this is both in, the first time in a plasma focused device and also the first time, especially in a uh, megamp uh, plasma focus. I'm getting a little bit of an echo. Am I holding it too close? No. Oh, okay. No, I'm not sure I, do I really need the mic? Okay, I'll use it. All right. So basically what I'm going to do is go over the hypotheses that led to using beryllium, uh, the advances we've achieved in the very early stages, the puzzles and questions that we still have, which are many, and the next steps that we're going to take. So the basic set of hypotheses that we're working on is that the limits on the uh, fusion yield that have been observed for many years with a large plasma focus is due to the lack of survival of the filaments that constitute the first stage of compression of the plasma. Basically, we're hypothesizing that, excuse me, that the high Z impurities at the start of the pulse, which cause early oscillations in the current, lead to the destruction of the filaments soon after they form. The loss of filaments causes lower plasmoid density at the time of the pinch, and the low density leads to lower yields, something like 10 times below the I to the fourth scaling law, which has been extrapolated from smaller devices. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen this chart or those like it dozens of times, but for those new to uh, plasma focus, this is the scaling law I'm talking about in which the neutron yield, uh, the fusion yield scales by I to the fourth with respect to the peak current. And these are our own results which follow but are a bit above this curve. But when you get to the magic number of one megamp, all of a sudden this curve turns over and becomes something of a plateau at uh, 10 to the 12th, or about one joule of fusion yield. So our hypothesis is reducing the impurity, preserving the filaments, can lead to the reestablishment of the scaling law. Now, I want to present today something of a new way of looking at the problem of fusion yield in a DPF. Now, obviously, in any fusion reaction, the yield is going to be proportional to, uh, it should be proportional, not equal to, there's some constants left out, uh, the square of the density, the volume, the confinement time, and the function of T, the temperature, which is essentially the reaction rate. Now, it's possible to simply reorganize this uh, equation algebraically to get this, which is density is proportional to a constant times the current over the alphane velocity and the radius and this whole thing squared, where A, the constant, is the number of loops of current. That is, if you have a confined uh, plasmoid in which the current is actually going around more than once, not just moving through it as in a simple pinch, then obviously the more times it loops over, the stronger the B field. If we further assume that tau is proportional to R, there are very good theoretical reasons for assuming this, 
then you get this striking relationship, which is the yield becomes proportional not only to the fourth power of I, but the fourth power of A and the, alphane, uh, the inverse of the alphane velocity. So if, again, we have strong theoretical reasons to believe that in the condensed plasmoid, the alphane velocity is approximately a constant, then the yield, increasing the yield, basically, becomes a problem of increasing this loop number. So to get the 16-fold increase in Y we need, all we need is to double this uh, current loop number. So that's sort of a definition of the problem. Now, in previous theoretical work, I've shown that if we take a simple model of the filaments as essentially a race between the expansion due to uh, thermal heating and the contraction due to pinching and the Raleigh-Taylor instability, we end up with, a, excuse me, with a formula in which the necessary alphane velocity is related to the impurity level, Fz squared. So this is basically the motivation by reducing the impurity level, we can get filamentation to be favored at lower alphane velocities, at lower rundown velocities. So that's what we're trying to do. The reason we chose beryllium is, of course, to reduce Fc squared. Beryllium has a Z of only four when fully ionized. Also, we wanted to reduce the oxides. Oxides cause a large amount of impurities because, of course, they're insulating and they have to be taken off for the current to get through to the metal. And in tungsten, oxidation is a big problem, but in beryllium, oxides are self-limited. The beryllium will form an oxide layer about 100 atoms thick, but then, as in stainless steel, as in chromium, that's self-limiting the oxygen can't get through that layer. We took other steps to exclude oxygen. We used a pre-bake out of all the uh, rubber and silicon seals, and we used a titanium nitride coating on our stainless steel chamber, which sort of sucks up the oxygen. So this is the uh, assembled chamber with the beryllium uh, barely visible inside. So this golden color is the titanium nitride, and these are the copper plates that we used for, to distribute the heat for the bake-out. So we added additional instruments, Langmuir probes, a Rogowski coil for the electron beam, electron spectrometer, uh, which is not yet uh, in use, as part of the general uh, upgrade of our device. So we upgraded our device so much that we have given it a new name, Focus Fusion 2B, 2B for beryllium and boron, and also hopefully for the future. So it has beryllium electrodes that are 10 centimeters long. They're actually identical to the tungsten um, electrodes we were experimenting with, except for they're made out of beryllium. The anode radius is 2.8 centimeters, and we got started very recently, uh, a little more than a month ago, on June 4th. So what happened? Well, <laughs> the first thing that happened was that we took off the beryllium oxide layer. And we knew that the first shot was going to take off that layer, but we weren't prepared for how dirty our electrodes looked after the first shot. And we thought to ourselves, my goodness, where did all this beryllium dust come from? Well, what we didn't realize, and what has been mentioned earlier in this conference, that beryllium dust is in the form of flakes, like snowflakes. And therefore, when they deposit, they're extremely porous. So this is actually worse than it looks. 
Fortunately, as we anticipated, after a number of shots, the dust was either melted onto the electrodes or swept away. So by shot 44, we actually have recovered our very shiny anode. And if you look on the inside of the anode, you can see this specular mirror-like mirror reflection that shows that except for a little ring of erosion, the anode is quite smooth. So we observed far less damage in our initial shots to the beryllium than to the tungsten, which is what we anticipated because the tungsten was really coated with tungsten oxide. So you see, in the old tungsten anode, near the insulator, there's this heavy vaporization that basically chews up the surface and makes it very rough. In the case of beryllium, there clearly has been some melting. There's a little waviness in the surface at about a 100 micron wavelength. But overall, you still retain the mirror-like surface and you don't get worse. This is after 44 shots. This is after 70 shots. Matter of fact, there's a little suggestion that it's even smoothing itself out. If we go to the other end where there's generally heavier erosion at the tip of the um, anode, we found that the same thing occurred, but only at pressures below 20 torr. When we went up to 30 torr, then we did start to get some erosion at the tip, but after a few shots at 12 torr, it started to smooth out again. So this self-smoothing of the beryllium was what we were hoping for and did achieve, and it's very different than the steady erosion of the tungsten. This is the tungsten anode outside the device after 150 shots, heavily vaporized. So in terms of quantitative measure, we took some quite a spectra after every shot, uh, at every shot, and we found that all of the lines could be identified with either hydrogen, beryllium, or oxygen. So, of course, these are the hydrogen lines. These are quite strong beryllium lines. Um, and the oxygen lines are actually lost here down in the noise. So we didn't observe any high Z impurities that had gotten in there by mistake. So that was very encouraging. If we look at the oxygen, we had to take a very saturated spectrum, but down here at very low level, you do find the oxygen lines. And if you compare them to what we got with tungsten, just taking the simple ratio of the oxygen lines to the H alpha line, we find that the oxygen is 10, 20 times less than for tungsten. Now, we do get beryllium de being deposited on the window shields. and We use these to cover our windows that are not in use and on the metal of the chamber wall. Now, you see, actually, on the chamber wall, this is quite shiny and metallic, while on the quartz, this is sort of dusty and very dull-looking. We're not quite sure why the physical difference but these deposits we can use to get a measure of how much is being deposited. And you can get that measure simply by comparing the spectra at various shots. And if you divide these spectra by each other, then you get a slope because any, any uh, transparent layer becomes less transparent at shorter wavelengths. So from the slope of this line, you can actually measure the thickness of the deposits and therefore the amount that's being deposited. And I just want to notice, uh, say this is comparing a very recent shot to a shot uh, early in the sequence, about a, a month earlier. And what you see in addition to this general slope, which is due to the absorption, you also see 
that the hydrogen lines appear stronger and these negative lines, these are all beryllium lines. And if you take the ratio, you find the beryllium lines have gone down by about a factor of three over the course of the month. So erosion seems to be slowing. And if you plot the uh, derived amount of um, coating, in other words, how much coating is accumulated per shot against the shot, you get an initial steep decline from the initial 25 nanometers down to about 0.35 nanometers per shot being coated onto the windows, and that's sort of leveled off. So when you do the arithmetic, we come out that the beryllium erosion is far less than tungsten. Now, by the way, like our colleagues in, with, the, uh, with JET, we don't know exactly where this is coming from. It's probably mostly coming from the bottom of the anode and not into the plasma uh, earlier in the shot. But we, we can't tell exactly how much. But in terms of total, if we assume uh, the deposits are about one gram per cc in density, we're getting about 70 micrograms per shot. That's less than 2% of the sheets by mass. So the FC squared from impurities is less than 0 0.04. By comparison, tungsten was deposited at twice as much rate. Of course, tungsten is much heavier, so it was far more weight. This lower FC squared has been confirmed by the fact that we observe about a two to three times reduction in X-rays for similar neutron yield. So the X-rays have gone down because the FC squared is, the total FC squared has gone down from about two or three to very close to unity. So we think that our first goal in these experiments has been achieved, that for the first time we have a low impurity, low erosion operation of a megaamp DPF. We achieved our goal of getting FC squared from impurities below 0.1. Oxygen went way down. Erosion of the beryllium is way down. And we get two order of magnitude decrease in the contribution of impurities to FC squared. Now, I don't know recent results from JET, but uh, at least a few years ago, JET reported uh, cleaning up their uh, impurities with a similar approach, that is lining JET with beryllium and uh, their numbers were about uh, 0.4 uh, contribution from e to FC squared. So this seems better than that, although I don't know the most recent results. Now, with all of that, we would expect, of course, better fusion yield. Well, unfortunately, now we have to transition from the advances into the puzzles and questions part of the presentation because, nope, we have not observed any increase in yield yet. So what we have here is these red dots are the new results from beryllium with the uh, neutron yield, the log, plotted against fill pressure of deuterium. And the blue dots are from the 10 centimeter identical tungsten electrodes. So you see the best results are, comp uh, are quite comparable but unfortunately, with the new results, you actually get a narrower peak in the distribution with respect to fill pressure. So why might this be the case? So we looked at, obviously, the way the pulses looked in terms of current. So at what is now the highest yielding pressure, which is 12 torr, of course, as we anticipated, we get a very early pinch. So the pinch happens before the pulse height, uh, 
pulse maximum of 1.8 nan- uh, microseconds. And we also get these rather disturbing big oscillations in current right at the start. If we go to higher pressure where we get a good matching of the pinch with the peak of the current, this looks very nice, but we still have the early oscillations. The DIDT actually never gets very big, and the yield is actually considerably lower. So instead of around 10 to the 11th, this is around 2 and a half times 10 to the 10th. And at the intermediate 24 tor, which theory would say would be the ideal, we get something quite similar, still very low yield, not big DIDT. Well, perhaps this should be expected. So we compared some of these shots with uh, Sing Lee's model. So Sing Lee's model is these blue curves. Of course, Sing Lee's model does not have these oscillations, which uh, we'll discuss what causes the energy in these oscillations, but the frequency of the oscillations has to do with the external circuit, which isn't modeled by uh, the Lee model. But if you look at the timing and the depth of the pinch, it's not so far off. So maybe this is to be expected. But we also would expect that with a deeper pinch, we would get higher yield. And for the smaller pinches, yeah, this seems to be the case as the log of the minimum DIDT goes up so does the yield, but with both the new results and the old results with tungsten, there seems to be a leveling off. Now with our results, we haven't gone high enough with DIDT to confirm this leveling off, but it seems to be going in that direction. So again, what is holding back? You would expect bigger DIDT, tighter pinch, more density, more yield, but we're not getting that. Well, simplest explanation, the 10 centimeter anode is just too short. We actually, with 14 centimeter anode uh, and cathode back in 2016, using tungsten, we got record yields for our device, which was twice, or t- more than twice as great. So you could say, well, The rundown is too slow at high pressure for filament formation, which we feel and other people feel requires a certain minimum velocity. And that when you get the high rundown at low pressures, your current is rising too rapidly at the time of the pinch, and that interferes with the good pinch formation. So if that's the explanation, then the question is, well, why did we pick 10 centimeters? Well, the reason is that's part of the plan. The plan is that we are installing, in place of our current 12 switches, which is one switch per capacitor, we're going to be installing 24 switches in the fall, which should result in a 30% reduction in inductance and a 17% reduction in rise time. In that case, the 10 centimeters should be just right. So we're basically in process of doing this. So if this is the process, if this is the whole problem, then that's great. Everything will come out in the wash in the fall. But that doesn't explain the early oscillations. Obviously, early in the pulse, the plasma has no idea that it's going to run into a 10 centimeter or 14 centimeter length. So there has to be some other reason for these early oscillations. Basically, these are a symptom of some sort of uneven breakdown. Our colleagues at uh, ICDMP were suggesting that perhaps this is, occurs when the switches fire unevenly. I looked at that and actually now, even when the switches are within 10 nanoseconds, we still get this early oscillation 
And sometimes it's worse when they fire all together than when one of them happens to be delayed by accident. We did get rid of these oscillations back in 2016 by using pre-ionization, but only when we used a mix of nitrogen and deuterium. The nitrogen had the role of stabilizing the pre-ionization current at a higher level because nitrogen is an insulating gas. And that did empirically very much reduce the oscillations. But we can't use nitrogen, or at the moment we're hesitant to use nitrogen with beryllium because beryllium reacts with nitrogen at high temperature to form beryllium nitride, which is also an insulator. So we didn't want to get into the situation of having to remove that. So just to look at this in a little more detail, this is um, a trace from 2016 with the nitrogen mix with preionization. And you see, even though you get oscillations in DIDT, they never cross the axis. So you don't get any downward oscillations in the current. You just get a ripple on the current as it's continuously moving upward. This is a recent shot in which we were using a neon mixture, and we got these severe, fast oscillations, and of course, a much smaller pinch. Well, the problem is to use neon as a substitute for nitrogen, that might be, might be a good substitute when you get to the pinching phase, but it's a very poor substitute for pre-ionization because neon is absolutely not an insulating gas. So it doesn't allow the pre-ionization current to get very high. So this is an illustration of what we're talking about. Right now, we are doing pre-ionization in what's called the dark discharge regime, which is a microampere regime in which as the current increases, the potential in the plasma increases, but then plateaus. So if you can get onto that plateau, you can get actually very far out in uh, these microamp currents, and that's enough to create the pre-ionization. But the problem is that with pure deuterium, if you get even a small amount of irregularities on the anode, you can't get onto that plateau. When you get to the top here, you get a breakdown. So that's what was cured with the nitrogen, and that's what is not cured with the neon. Well, so those are the problems. So what are the next steps? Well, there are some possible cures that we've been thinking about. We haven't reached any conclusions because we just completed this series of shots at the beginning of the week. So we're still thinking about things. But here are some ideas. Maybe we could stabilize the pre-ionization by simply going to higher deuterium pressure. But we've seen that that leads to higher erosion with the beryllium. Also, we're not at all sure that it will work. On one shot, we did get uh, higher current at higher pressure, but it didn't really affect the oscillations. Maybe we should say nitrogen is not so bad, because if we don't use nitrogen and we don't use neon, we don't have a mixing gas. Now, that's a problem because we're intending to go on to hydrogen boron before the end of the year. Hydrogen boron is a mix, and we wanted to experiment with a mix of gases to sort of emulate the boron. So if we don't use neon, we don't use nitrogen, there isn't really anything left. So on the other hand, we don't want to kid ourselves that maybe nitrogen is simply going to greatly increase erosion because it's going to put an, an insulating layer down. So we have to look at the chemistry and whether anybody else has experience with this, such as with the tokamaks. Well, 
deck of a rain is probably an insulating gas, so maybe this problem will just go away when we go to deck of a rain, which is the hydrogen boron compound. Well, first of all, we don't really know much. I don't see anybody in the literature knows much about the electrical properties of deck of a rain. So we have to find out more about that. And second of all, that means we won't really have any cure to the problems with pure deuterium. So that would be a big uh, downside to that approach. Finally, one of our colleagues, Paul Hess, some of you know him, he, uh, his company produces ICCD cameras. He got interested in this problem way back a year ago, two years ago, and he suggested we go to the much higher current abnormal glow discharge regime. And that might solve the problem by generating much higher currents in pure deuterium. But he's been having trouble getting symmetric operation. So what is abnormal glow discharge? I certainly didn't know, so let me just explain. Um, I learned about this a few years ago, just looking it up in the literature. This is a chart from Wikipedia. So in any low current discharge, you have the dark discharge regime, the plateau of the dark discharge, then a glow discharge, a normal glow discharge, in which the uh, voltage actually decreases with increasing current, and then the abnormal gets gas discharge, glow discharge, in which the uh, voltage goes up with the current. Now, I don't know how it got this name abnormal, since, of course, you'd really think that this was the abnormal part. But anyway, the point is, if you are down in this regime, you get the voltage too high, you go into a breakdown that goes right over to the arc regime. Obviously, if you're in this regime, you can't have a symmetric breakdown because it's energetically more favorable for the current to be all concentrated in one direction. If you're over here, it's energetically more favorable <coughs> excuse me, for the current to be equally distributed. So if you can get into this regime without getting a breakdown, then you can get orders of magnitude about a thousand times more current. So we're going to be looking into this, and we have some ideas of how to avoid breakdown. Now, we haven't actually determined whether the first part of this hypothesis is valid. In other words, are we getting filaments now, and they're just not producing the results that we expect, or are we still not getting filaments? Well, we have a way of determining this directly by observation. We're going to point our ICCD camera this summer up towards the top of the anode and see whether the filaments exist. Excuse me. <clears throat> so, in addition, of course, we're in our final stages of preparing for using decaborane in the, the by the end of the year. So our plan is to move from deuterium to hydrogen because hydrogen is going to be used to mix with small amounts of decaborane. We're going to introduce this slowly into a well-functioning hydrogen pinch and then slowly move to pure uh, decaborane. Now we're going to do this both because we've never worked with any such mixes so it's good to introduce it slowly, and also because it is incredibly expensive. We obtained 99.996% isotopically pure B11 decaborane. And because this was produced at a laboratory scale, we had to pay an arm and a leg for it. So obviously we want to use as little as possible, as well as introducing it slowly for observational reasons. 
but we have obtained that. It's sitting in the refrigerator in our uh, lab. Now, if we get any fusion yield at all, a secondary reaction produces carbon-11. And since carbon-11 has a 20-minute half-time, highly radioactive, we have to be able to run the machine without entering the X room. So we've been in the process of uh, getting a dump chamber into our vacuum system and getting everything set up for complete remote monitoring, complete remote operation from our main uh, uh, control room, which is shielded by three feet of concrete, so we won't worry about C11 from the control room. So we'd still hope to get there and do some the first uh, actual, what we call focus fusion experiments, before January. So that's basically where we stand. Thank you, and I hope we have time for some good conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And please, questions. Uh, Eric, I have just two questions. For us, you discussed the role of filaments. Uh, have you, but you haven't presented any image of those filaments in visible relation or X-rays. Have you measured? Have you seen those filaments? No, that's what I, exactly what I'm saying. Is that we do not have any evidence at the moment, one way or the other, of the filaments existing or not existing. To be frank, we've been having trouble with the ICCD, so we've had to relocate its optical path. And uh, so the answer is we don't know whether getting rid of the impurities have allowed the filaments to exist or that more conditions such as an even breakdown have to be made. Now, I will just say one thing about last year, and I simply forgot to include this image in the thing. In um, last year's results, which I think we did report at a conference last year, we did get images of filaments forming with tungsten very early in the rundown. But we also got images of those filaments being destroyed, that they simply blew up and later in the rundown, there was no sign of them. And we've had images in the past of the end of the rundown coming into the pinch where we don't see the filaments. So basically, with tungsten, we find, feel that the evidence is the filaments exist, but don't make it even halfway down the anode. And with beryllium, we simply don't know one way or the other. Thank you. Uh, second question refers to the role of insulator. Uh, in principle, the formation of current sheets and the primary filaments should strongly depend on properties, surface properties of insulator. Uh, have you trained your insulator before those discharges you reported? Have we what? Trained, insulator? trained season for just shots for training of insulator. To, for forming the insulator properties, proper time. You know, in, non, in usual machine, PF machine, oh, you, you, you have 20, 50 shots before you get a good result. Right, well, yes, that's, that's the optimistic hypothesis, but I'm, I hesitated to do that. In our machine, we get the first pinch in the first few shots and we get a very steep rise, presumably due to the conditioning of the insulator, in the first 10 or 12 shots. So that's in the past. We're up to shot 70. Now, I could easily argue, well, that was with tungsten. Beryllium is eroding more slowly. Possibly the coating process is going more slowly. Maybe if we just keep firing, things will get better and better. The reason why I'm a little suspicious of this optimistic scenario is that in the 
last couple of weeks as we've moved from 50 up to 70 shots, and this is not counting pre-fires and things where the bank hasn't fired, there does seem to be a considerable leveling off. We're certainly not seeing any sort of steep climb. climb. On the other hand, we haven't achieved stable functioning either. Like, for example, um, let's see. Yeah, so if you look at this, oh, no, no, not that one. If you look at this graph, basically, we are seeing still an increase in the DIDT. That is still going up significantly, but it's not reflected in increases in the yield. So we don't know for certain whether we're going to take this path, which is similar to the tungsten, or the up more optimistic path extrapolating these results. We'll just have to see. But I hesitate to predict that we'll take the optimistic path. We don't have any evidence that. We're not sure that conditioning is still occurring. Thank you, Eric, for your talk. I have three questions for you, basic one. So your ICCD camera works in which spectrum? You are planning to visualize this in soft X-ray, visible? No, this is, this is visible and uh, near UV. OK. Now, one of the problems probably is that the coating is probably uh, more heavily affecting the near UV and the rest of the spectrum. Uh, we definitely will have to clean the windows externally. And I was just talking, uh, uh, I don't think the colleague from JET is here to, this morning, but uh, they were trying the same idea as we were thinking about, is zapping it with a laser in place. Um, so we hope that we'll find uh, a cleaning technique and if so, maybe Jet will pay us to clean their windows, too. So, um... Jet will not pay. What? <laughs> Jet will not pay for cleaning windows. You cannot touch them. You can't what? You cannot touch them. Uh, uh, these are double windows. Once uh, they can be replaced uh, before the deuterium tritium, but forget that you would be cleaning them uh, in situ. Uh, well, ours are, ours are single windows, so we have a better chance. Okay, uh, you showed the pictures of uh, your chamber after a few dozen discharges, 44, then 70, so you, after each few dozens of discharges, you open actually the chamber, and how you determine this deposit density? Uh, one more time. No, no, no. Uh, those, those pictures were taken through a protected window. Ah, okay. So basically we have two unprotected windows and uh, two protected windows that have little glass shields inside. And uh, this is a vacuum device available commercially and you just turn the knob and you can open or close them externally. So uh, as I say, the way we determine, this is a, a well-known technique, to determine a, the thickness of a transparent layer, the absorption of that layer, um, if it isn't too thick, obviously, is a uh, exponential function of the, relation, of the ratio of the thickness to the wavelength of light. So therefore, if you take a control spectrum before anything dirties our windows, and then you divide that into a uh, spectrum obtained 
in the same conditions, then the slope of that spectrum is directly proportional to the thickness by a well-known formula. So that means that the total amplitude doesn't matter, it's only the slope. So it doesn't matter if you're exactly along the same uh, line of sight. So that's how we get the thickness. Okay, and the last question. I really didn't understand why are you so concerned with these oscillations? They are at the beginning of your total discharge current traces? Or? Yes. Well, I noticed uh, PF24 has exactly the same oscillations. Well, I think that, I strongly think that with the plasma focus, the quality and symmetry of the breakdown has a big effect on what happens afterwards. The, the plasma has a memory that lasts at least as long as a single shot, I think in, in some ways longer. Um, so I think if you get an uneven breakdown, you can't get the symmetry needed for a tight pinch. Thanks. Okay. We, have, we are out of time, but last question. Just a point to your uh, last slide about this uh, proton uh, boron 11 reaction. Uh, uh, do you think about this reaction from the reactor point of view? Because both the Q value and uh, the cross section uh, actually exclude this reaction from uh, uh, the reactor uh, application. Well, and there is no uh, also carbon 11 because the intermediate compound is just carbon 12. I'm sorry, what, what did you say about carbon 11? Uh, there is, in this reaction, the intermediate, the intermediate nuclei is carbon 12. No, okay. Well, we have published considerably on this question, so I'll give you some references. But basically, there are two reasons why the old argument saying PB11 can't give you net energy are wrong. One is, the actual cross-sections, as measured more and more accurately, have increased considerably. So the calculations that everybody points to were done with cross-sections that are about a factor of two too low. So that's one point. The other point is the big argument is X-ray cooling, that basically you say, well, the Brumstrahlung is if the electrons and the ions are at the same temperature, the Bremsstrahlung is far too great to allow heating to uh, fusion temperatures. We did papers in which we pointed out an effect that is essentially only relevant to DPF and laser fusion, which is in the case of a strong magnetic field, very strong field, there are quantum effects that make it the heating of the electrons by the ions far less efficient than the heating of the electrons of the ions by the electrons. So, and this is a phenomenon that's been well studied in astrophysical cases, and therefore you can get a huge difference between the temperature of the electrons and the temperature of the ions the electrons being at much lower temperature. That, of course, decreases your X-rays and allows you to get very efficient fusion burn. So, in detail, I'll refer you to some of the papers. <laughs>